Hi guys, I'm Jim. I'm this Alex. Is, this is Alex. And what? Huh? <laughs> Sorry about that. That's that's okay. Um, in this video, we decided we would talk about dungeons. Dungeons. The creation of dungeons. Why dungeons exist. How to make dungeons. Yeah. Um, some of the things to keep in mind when you're developing that underground lair or that whatever for your players to to adventure through. Um, I've been doing dungeons now for over 40 years, I guess, and there has been a change through time in the way that I approach the, the development of dungeons. But it's always been fun. It's I think it's one of the, the most interesting parts of developing your campaign. And so we're going to give you some details, things that I do, some things that maybe Alexander has done as well, uh, just to give you some, some ideas, uh, stimulate the brain cells a little bit to, to uh, develop a dungeon as best you can. There you go. So back when I first started playing the game around 1978, um, we started the game with, I started the game with what's known as now, what's now known as Holmes Basic. And at that time, the game really was nothing but a big dungeon crawl. You roll up a character, you went down underground in a dungeon that was put together by your dungeon master. You killed monsters, you got treasure, you took the treasure back to town so that you could buy more equipment that allowed you to go in and kill bigger monsters, get bigger treasure, and go back to town and sell the treasure or the magic items and get more stuff. So that, that was pretty much the game. Um, and TSR, they really understood that at the time as well. When, when this Holmes Basic came out, one of the things that they did was they included in it something called Dungeon Geomorphs. And these are the Dungeon Geomorphs that I first used. We'll give you a close-up look on these in a minute. But all they are was they, they came in a sheet and it was a, it basically had a, the layout of a dungeon on it and then you cut that sheet into different pieces and then you combined them together to make something that was random, something that was uh, particular to your campaign. And then you had the responsibility as the dungeon master to go in and label all the rooms and put things into the rooms. So the monsters, the treasures, the traps. A lot of fun for me. I, this is, I, can, I have vivid memories of laying this, these dungeon geomorphs out and coming up with something that my friends could adventure through and, and try and have a, um, a fun experience in. But as time went by, um, I started to realize that I really didn't have much logic behind the development of the dungeon that was created with these dungeon geomorphs. All I was doing was saying, oh, I think that we could put five ogres in this room, and then right next door we'll have ten orcs, and then over here we'll have three trapped elves. And there was really no rhyme or reason for why those things took place. So when we first started playing, and we were in junior high school at the time, that was okay. It was, it was okay to have that, that uh, random element into the dungeon. But as the players became more sophisticated, and I like to think that I became more sophisticated as well, I started having to pursue logic for for my dungeon. I had to create a, a dungeon ecosystem, for lack of a better phrase, because the players, as far as I was concerned, needed to have a logical system to make decisions off of, something that wasn't random, something that they could rely upon to make the best decision possible moving forward and, and maybe fighting monsters or gathering treasure. But you also had to have, I also had to have as a DM, I had to have in my head a logical system as well. How did these monsters exist in the same space? Should they exist in the same space? What was it that they were eating? What was it that they were, uh, what, what was the reason for being there in the first place? So with these dungeon geomorphs, geomorphs, over time I actually went back and changed them considerably. After the players had gone through and used up everything for this particular dungeon, this was called the, uh, the Trollin' Dungeon. Uh, it was like I said, it was my very first one, but I went back and changed it several years in a row just to make it reflect more of what I thought would be a component of reality. It, it made it a bit more realistic in my own mind, and that allowed me to pass that realism on to my players. The same concepts apply to dungeon creation. Those same, those same ideas carry over to country. Mm -hmm. creation, city creation, region creation, world creation. The logic that goes behind uh, the development of a lot of these things, it's applicable across the board as far as your Dungeons and Dragons campaign is concerned. But here, 
we mostly want to focus on the dungeon because that's you know done. I think it's the basic. It's the base. It's the most. It's the most baseline thing that you can create. So uh, again, the first thing that we really put an emphasis on when we're creating these dungeons is creating a storyline that surrounds it, like he's right. been talking about. Um, creating the setting. If you're in a forest, if you're in a swamp, if you're in the mountains, if you're in a town, uh, the docks, if you're underwater, whatever it might be. Um, these are kind of things that we like to plan out ahead of time and have uh, sort of the background for where would your players encounter this in the first place. Right. What are the steps right. that they would have to go through to get to this point? And from that, why would they logically be there? What are they looking for? Um, once you have kind of these basic requirements, these basic ideas uh, written out and created, that's when you can really start to get into the more specific aspects of what you're trying to do with your dungeon. Yeah, and I think that the development of the dungeon, <clears throat> at least for me when, when I first started creating these things, I went from the dungeon and I went bigger. Over time, I've actually reversed that. Mm -hmm. And I've started from the bigger picture and then taken my way down to the dungeon. But that doesn't mean that the concepts of development are, are, are any different. So what I think that we might do is I'll take a dungeon that I developed um, 25 or 30 years ago and we'll take a look at that and it's it has an interesting storyline that we've attached to it and I think that pretty much everybody, all the players that I currently have playing in my campaign have all been through it at some point or another. It means I'll have to go back and re repopulate it, change it around a bit to show its, its uh, transition through time. But uh, yeah, I think it's, it's a safe one to use, so we'll go with that. Let's do it. So, like I was saying, my my development ideas for creating dungeons changed through time. And it reached a stage where I was no longer making a dungeon and then filling out the surrounding countryside. I started off with the countryside and then narrowed down as to why a dungeon would exist in the first place. Um, this particular dungeon, like I said, was about, I did it maybe 30, 35 years ago. But the reasoning behind it, and I'm just going to jump into the story behind it. The reason that I developed this one was because the players that I had playing with me at the time, they were in a particular region that had been uh, a frontier until about 50 years ago. And the fact that that region, you know, I, I started trying to think, okay, what kind of things would have been uh, created in a frontier situation? And what I came up with was a warlord type scenario. If you have a frontier, they're very often strongmen who are trying to impose their will upon the surrounding population. And in this particular instance, two of these strongmen created a dungeon that they used as a base of power in order to dominate the surrounding countryside. So I had the reason, therefore, why this particular thing should exist, but then I needed the story of the dungeon itself and why it would be interesting to the explorers or to the adventurers. Well, I got to thinking, okay, I've got this, this stronghold that these individuals, these, these two strongmen, these two warlords have put together. What kind of a political situation would they have found themselves in? What kind of a, um, what kind of interaction would, would they have had with the surrounding countryside? And I decided that these were going to be two individuals who were, uh, as warlords, they were also very tyrannical. They spent a lot of time dominating everyone, both physically and economically, in the region. And eventually, people had enough of that, had had enough of that, and um, I also threw in some slavery aspects where the warlords were going and stealing or enslaving people in the surrounding villages. And eventually, the people had had enough of this, and there was an uprising, and the, uh, through some trickery, the people in the surrounding area managed to gain entrance into the dungeon, and they ended up slaughtering all the people inside, including the two warlords. Um, the use of magic, uh, the, kind of a last ditch effort by the warlords to stop this uh, insurrection, if you will, led to the use of some heavy magic, which killed everybody in the dungeon. So that was, I, I had the concept of as to why the dungeon would exist. The next thing that I needed to do was design the dungeon itself from the perspective of the warlords. And that, to me, is the most fun part. And the way I do that, I don't just start randomly drawing squares and then connecting them with hallways and doors. I actually imagine what it would have been like for the engineers that were hired by the warlords to get started on this, this outpost, this underground outpost. And I try to think of it as the engineers would as they tunneled their way into the mountain to create something for the warlords to operate out of, something that the warlords had requested. Sometimes uh, 
I go a little bit further than that and I try to decide, well, would these engineers have been enslaved? Have, have they been forced to create this for someone? Uh, in this case, they were actually hired, but I've also done things where uh, the, the engineers were forced into, into servitude, as I said, and so that, also, that has, a, that has a, an influence on the way things go. And so sometimes things don't work as well. Traps don't work as well as they might otherwise do. There might be some places where the um, engineers, the enslaved engineers or the forced engineers, they might have tried to take advantage of the situation and they may have been stealing things during the interim. They may have had a way to, they may have found a way to uh, connect to natural caves in order to escape if they thought that the people who were enslaving them were going to try and kill them after the project was done. So there are all kinds of different things that I look at when I develop these. Do the players end up knowing all this? They really don't. What most of, most of the reason I do this is I enjoy doing it. It gives an air of reality to the dungeon, uh, for the dungeon to me, and then when I describe what's going on to the players, I can impart a more realistic viewpoint to them and hopefully they'll make better decisions because there's a skeletal structure that makes sense. They won't know all of the different bones of that skeletal structure, but at least they'll have some understanding of why things are working the way they do and why things are there. And that might encourage them to say, hey, treasure X, Y, and Z are here. We know these different elements of the story. I wonder if there's a treasure like this. And there's a good chance that that might actually be the case if I've put enough effort into it due to the development of the dungeon. And if nothing else, speaking from the perspective of someone who spends more time as a player than DMing, it, even if the, I, I go through a dungeon like this and it, I don't understand everything that's been going on, I don't understand the entirety of the storyline or whatever the case may be, it makes my experience more enjoyable as a player. And if, if you're a DM, creating those background storylines that people can investigate makes it more interesting because... Um, for the DM as well. Yeah, but, 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 but for the players can't be forgotten with this because if you're going through something that is completely random and there's no rhyme or reason to where anything is it still can be fun but once you've done that two three times then it starts to get old a little bit because there's not there's nothing deeper there's nothing um more in terms of development that your character can start to understand but if you're able to understand these storylines you're able to think about that as you're going through the dungeon it places you in that fantasy world that you're starting to build just that much more which is really, we think, a crucial part of the game is, again, creating these storylines. And as a player, if you can go through and even understand a small part of that storyline, it makes a more um, it's vibrant... More it's more vivid. It's, yeah, it's a more vivid, vibrant, detailed world that you're finding yourself in. And that makes it easier to imagine. It makes it easier to relate to things that are going on. And it just improves your experience overall. And if, if that's not there, and it is, again, completely random with no thought or storyline put into it, I find myself having difficulty caring about the character that I've created as much because right. there's no um, there's no weight to anything that I'm doing. There's yeah. no deeper meaning behind what's going on. It's all just superficial. Go in, kill things, find gold, and that's fun to, can, a, to it, an it extent. Can, it can be to fun. An extent. Yeah. There's nothing inherently wrong with that. Just over the course of playing with the same people, say repeatedly, then it can get a little bit boring. Yeah. So. Well, let's, yeah. ta let's just take a look. We'll take a closer look. When I was talking about how uh, I see it from the perspective of the engineers or the quarrymen or the stonemasons who are going in and building this, but also I try to look at it from the perspective of the warlords. What would they have wanted their dungeon to be like? And so let's take a quick look here at this map. We're not going to go through all the different levels, but let's just take a quick look at the map itself and... I'll give you some idea of what I was thinking when I put this particular dungeon together. So as I was looking at this, the first thing I thought was what function does this serve? Well, for one thing, it's, a, it's an expression of power for these two warlords. And secondarily, it was to be a military style base, a place where they could uh, project their power out into the surrounding countryside. And keep in mind, there was also, I, I have to figure, that there were probably also other warlords in the area who might have wanted to take over some of their territory, and that was something that they needed to be taking into account when they built this structure. But also, as I was developing this, I wanted to make sure that the story of the uprising was represented in the creation of the dungeon at the same time. So, coming into the side here, this is a very simple situation where it's just, there's a recess in the side of a mountain. The engineers decided to use that as the entry point into the complex.
So the first thing you encounter as you come into the dungeon is you've got two large brass doors here, um, and they dominate the basically they dominate this entire cliff. As an adventurer, the first thing that you see when you make your way through these rusted doors, um, there are skeletons everywhere. And each one of the X's that I've put on here are skeletons. And so if you pay close enough attention as the explorer, when you if you put an X where most of these concentrations of skeletons are, you actually get part of a story from that as well. I won't go into the details on that because we may have some players come into this at some point and I don't want to give it away in a video. But so you've got your, your brass doors here, a long entry hallway that comes down here to a place where there are two thrones, where the two warlords could sit and they could receive um, some of the local villagers, some of the local townspeople when they came in to pay tribute. So it's an expression of the warlord's power right there front and center as soon as you come in. There's also a guard room here off to the side, which is kind of a standard thing in a lot of medieval castles. But then one of the things that I like to do occasionally in dungeons is put in things that have water involved. So maybe it's an underground river, maybe it's an underground lake. And what I did over in this area over here to the left was I decided to make a large pool area, which could have, um, which was a place where they could entertain some of the, some of the people that they were, they saw themselves as being on par with. And then as you moved around to the right side here off of the main room, I had I figured there had to be accommodations for the people who worked there. So for there's a barracks there. There are a number of different things that in this area that would have involved just with the day to day running of, of a complex like this. You've got to have food storage. You've got to have a place where food is made. Uh, you have to have workshops. You have to have things where weapons are, are sharpened or, or reforged or, or fixed based on because of something that might have happened to them in a, in a skirmish or something nearby. You have to have all of those things involved. If you look up in this area, you'll notice that I have some uh, zigzag hallways. Well, the zigzag hallways are there for defense. I wanted the engineers and the warlords to come to, to realize that they weren't invulnerable and if a certain amount of force was used to break into this, this complex, they needed to have a way to retreat down to a certain area that they considered safer. So almost a keep, if you will, in a, uh, the equivalent of a keep in a, in a medieval castle. But these zigzag hallways gave better areas for defense with, uh, by men with crossbows. And then uh, continuing on, I mean, there, I won't go to get into all the other details of these rooms that you see in here, but back here, one thing I will point out is back here in the very back, as these two warlords continued to dominate this area over a series of decades, it reached a stage where they became more and more cruel. And one of the things that they ended up doing was they started a small, I guess, for lack of a better phrase, a set of gladiatorial games that they did once a month where they would go out and they would take people from the surrounding villages and they would force them to fight for their entertainment down in this, this um, little amphitheater down here. It's something that's set down further into the ground. But this, this, is a, this gives you an overview of the kind of thought process that I had when I was developing this dungeon uh, all those years ago. But it's something that, again, if people paid enough attention to it as they were going through, and I've, I've had players who really do like to pay attention, they really like to try and figure out the story that I put in behind things. Um, if they paid attention to what was written on the walls, if they paid attention to mosaics that had been constructed by the, um, the warlords, uh, there were also mosaics that had been stolen from other places and, and brought in and installed. And if they paid attention to that, if they paid attention to where uh, bodies were found, if they paid attention to the types of treasures that were found in certain areas, they could come up with an entire storyline that wasn't necessary. It just made, as we said before, it just made the experience of going through this dungeon that much more vivid. And I also put racial situations into it. So for elves and dwarves, and the way the warlords treated them. And so for the characters who were dwarves or who were elves, there were some connections there that they could see about the way elves were treated or the way that dwarves were treated that made, again, a kind of a connection there that might have led them to want to figure out even more. And maybe it was finding out family connections, finding out if their families were involved in what had, what had taken place in this decades ago. 
Um, and that led to, uh, that, was, that created an opportunity for going out and starting entirely new adventures. So this was, not only was this a, an adventure in and of itself, trying to figure out what was happening here, it also served as a springboard for what the characters might want to do next. Very often, um, the best adventures that I have are the ones that uh, players decide they want to pursue on their own. And there were loads of things in here that players could have taken and, um, and headed off in a different direction with at any time. So, you know, as far as one of my earlier dungeons that actually had a good storyline and had some depth of development, this is, this is one of the ones that I, I find to be the best. Now, in terms of the way it was developed, all you've got is a piece of graph paper, get yourself a pencil, and you start going. As you're doing it, just write down a number for each one of the different things because as if you're doing it from the perspective of the engineers, you're going to be thinking about what they were thinking as they were digging through this mountain complex. And then all you do is as you those ideas come into your head, you write them down in a separate sheet of paper. And so the key number one, start there right at the beginning with the gate. Number two, the guardhouse and so on as it moves its way through. It's not a hard thing to do. The only hard part is coming up with the interweaved interwoven stories that you might want to include in the development of the dungeon. But really that just takes practice like anything else. It does. Um, creativity isn't something that, you know, anybody who plays this game isn't it has an inherently creative side. Right. But it's it's not something that you can expect to just flourish the first time that you try and do something. Creativity is something that you have to work on just like anything else and build upon. So start with something basic if you've never done anything like this before and build your way up into these more complex storylines. Um, and then eventually the more dungeons that you have, you can tie them together in different ways. So it all really, if it seems daunting, I can completely understand that because it's only been, I don't know, 10 years since I've really started doing this stuff as well when I was a lot younger. But um, it really just comes down to picking up a pencil, getting a piece of paper and starting to do it. And letting your imagination take off. Exactly. It doesn't matter. Nobody ever has to see the things you create initially. If you don't like what you create, start over. It's not a big deal. Um, but chances are that once you get going, you'll really start to get those creative juices flowing and you'll start pulling inspiration from a lot of different areas mm -hmm. uh, and applying it to something that you want to create. Basically, I think that probably one of the strongest pieces of advice that I can give when starting to create these things is make something that you would enjoy going through yes. if you were playing the game. W without a doubt. Yeah, because there are ideas that you might have as a player with, oh, I wish that I could go and do this with my character make that so that then other people can experience the things that you think are cool because chances are what you think is cool other people are going to like too and you will put more effort into it mm -hmm. if you think it's cool absolutely so and, and and that that's excellent advice the thing that you have to do after you've got the story of what happened is you want to make sure that your dungeon is not a static point in time so in this particular in the case of this particular dungeon after the locals led their uprising and they ended up um, attacking the, the complex and first forcing their way inside and then they were all killed by a last ditch use of magic by the warlords, that can't be the end of the story. There has to be another layer of history to this particular location. So you have to then figure out, okay, well, what monsters would have moved in here through time? Um, were there already monsters living in this in this complex somehow? Maybe they were hidden. Maybe they were just next door in this, for instance, in this hidden pool. You've got to figure out what has taken place up until the minute those adventurers walk in through the front doors or force their way through the front doors. Because again, that's all part of the story. And I'm a believer that if you don't have that continuity, from the time that the complex where, where the first pick was being swung to excavate this complex out. If you don't have the continuity from that point all the way up until the day that the adventurers forced their way into the ruined complex, that's something the players are going to actually pick up on. I mean, I think that maybe a good way to describe this in something that I'm sure that all of you have seen in some capacity would be using um, the Mines of Moria as an example uh, yes. of that time layering yes. that he's talking about. Because basically you have three different time periods that are unfolding as you go through it, maybe four. You've got the modern goblins and orcs who live there currently as they make their way in. You've got the dwarves who initially built the complex and the dwarves who tried to make their way back in. But then you go back even further and you've got the Balrog coming from right. deep down inside the construction. It's creating those 
layers that makes it diverse and interesting. Yes. Because if it was just one of those, it wouldn't be wouldn't nearly be. as cool to go through and, and, and experience as you're reading or watching the movies. That's a really good example. Um, really, really good. That's that's exactly what I'm, I'm trying to get across here is that, yeah, it, it would be lessened if you didn't have yeah. all of those layers of that story. Yeah. It just, it just makes things more interesting for watching, reading, or playing through it. Um, so, it, it, and just start with one. Don't try and do all at the same time. Start with one storyline and then add other storylines on to layer it. And that'll just make it more interesting for your players. And, and again, it all comes down to just having it in your mind's eye what has taken place here over mm -hmm. time. And it, you'd be surprised after you've done it a few times. It may work for you great the very first time you do it. If you feel like you're struggling a little bit, um, it may end up being something that will take you, you know, the better part of a year or six months or so to, to develop. But don't give up on it. It can be, for me, it's one of the most fulfilling things about playing this game. Absolutely. So, should we move on from here? We shall. To something that I would call maybe the next level of, or maybe a couple new, of, a couple of other levels of dungeon development in D&D. Absolutely. Let's check it out. So another way that you can communicate dungeon stuff mm -hmm. to your players is through the use of miniatures and have, have more of a miniature focused dungeon. Now, which we know a lot of you do. And uh, there are actually some really cool things you can do now, especially with 3D printing. Mm -hmm. If you haven't done any 3D printing, uh, I did a video about it maybe a year and a half, two years ago, Something showing like how easy it really can be once you have your printer to download and print things off. But there are no end of resources out there to allow you to make a dungeon. You can make a complete dungeon with 3D printed materials. But if you wanted to, you could set up, in, in this particular case, I have a Dwarven Forge here. Uh, we don't play this way. Uh, to me, I, it's just, I'm very old school about things. So most of what I do, it, it takes place in my mind and the minds of my players. But there is something that's very satisfying about putting together a complex or a, a dungeon or an underground a subterranean uh, cave system or whatever through 3D printed items that your adventurers can then adventure their way through. So in this particular case, I've got some skeletons that I've printed off. I've got the com this uh, Dwarven Forge itself. But there are also some adventurers over here who, yeah, they haven't been painted yet, but they could be. <laughs> but you can use the squares within each one of these 3D printed um, setups to dictate how you're moving through, almost like a board game. I know some people who use 3D printed items and miniatures to be a bit more freeform. So all they'll do is they'll end up using miniatures to show the location of people during an encounter, or maybe they'll use them to show the people the location of people when they're entering a room to open a chest in a dungeon, something like that. But there is something to be said for some of these, again, some of these things that you can create on a 3D printer that have a lot of really cool ambiance. I mean, I love this one here, this Shrine to Orcus, where you've got your torches going. Yeah, this hand hasn't been painted yet either. Give me time. But there's just a, there are just a lot of things that can create a cool feeling yeah. when you're, if you want to be playing with miniatures. There are so many things out there, so many things that can enhance the gaming with miniatures uh, as opposed to what it was, say, 20 years ago, where things were on, made out of cardboard and you cut them out and pasted them together and then said, okay, here's a tower. Nowadays, you can print these things off and you can do it in really high quality for really very limited money. I mean, I could go out and buy these from uh, Wizards of the Coast, these types of miniatures from Wizards of the Coast. They might cost me four or five bucks a piece. I can print them off for about 15 cents. So something just to keep in mind, but this is another way that people have moved on as far as dungeon development is concerned. But I don't think you're ever going to get quite the same complexity in a 3D printed dungeon as you are just in something that's on graph paper, simply because of the time constraints and the material constraints involved. That doesn't discount it as being something really interesting. It can be, and maybe the 3D printed side of things can be just an addendum to what you do on your graph paper. At least that's what we would end up doing yeah. as far as we're concerned. As far as we're concerned with playing with miniatures. Um, and I mean, maybe you do have the ability and wherewithal to make an entire dungeon out of this. And if if you do, uh, out of 3D printing things or buying them straight from Wizards of the Coast or whatever, whoever else, um, the same things kind of apply with what we've talked about. You can yeah. still use a lot of the aspects that the positive things that miniatures offer you, uh, the add-ons, 
but you can still create deep complex uh, dungeons with a lot of storyline with things that are going to be interesting for your character and things like that it can just depending on how you use them um, they can just add it another, can enhance yeah it can it just can enhance and add another can. layer if that's the way that you like to play let's now take a look at what I think is probably the best the pinnacle the, 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 at this point at this stage in time it is one of the best things I that I think has come along for a long time that combines some of the graphic interest of 3D printing as well as um, the best parts of the old graph style, graph paper style development of dungeons. Yes. Let's have a look. Uh, so from what we kind of talked about with the miniatures, with sort of creating this visual representation of what's going on, um, we wanted to talk about a computer program we found called Dungeon Draft that we are huge fans of. Yep. Um, if any of you have ever heard of Wonder Draft, or if we've ever mentioned it before, it's made by the same people, uh, the same company that created it. I, no, I think it's like a guy. Yeah, it's like a, a, a dude, basically. Um, but we we love Dungeon Draft and everything that you can do with it. Uh, it's essentially, uh, it gives you a grid to begin with, and then you can just go through and trace out your dungeon or your town or whatever else you want to create. And then your, use, your country, your, if yeah. you use Wonder Draft, you can do countries. Uh, go to our website. You can see some examples, or oh, actually our coffee page. You can see some examples yeah. of some of the things that we've done in Dungeon Draft and on Wonder Draft. But um, with Dungeon Draft, essentially all that you do is you can draw out the outline of whatever dungeon you want. You can create caves, uh, create the basic outline as you would essentially on graph paper if, if you were to use it. It's the same process. But then uh, you can add in preloaded assets that come with the program all throughout your dungeon, like tables, beds, um, monsters, crates, Statues, fruit. vegetation, yeah, and anything you could really ever need to put into a dungeon um, to kind of th make it seem more alive, they have something that you can do that you can put in. Well, and I, you know, we've we've even taken it beyond that. We've gone and we've made inns out of it. We've made taverns. We've mm -hmm. made just no end of things that you might want to throw out to say, okay, you go into this building. Here's what it looks like on the inside. Uh, and to me, it's the best of both worlds. It's got the flexibility of the graph paper dungeon, mm -hmm. but it's also got the graphic aspects that you would bring to things if you were uh, dealing with miniatures and 3D printed things. Yeah. It let's, just, let's show an example. Let's show some examples that we have created. So this, um, as you can see, this thing that we've put out here, this is an example of something that we've created for a game that we're developing using the Dungeon Draft program. Uh, and if you take a look, essentially you can kind of see how it works, what the outcome is going to be. You just take your cursor, it gives you varying sizes of, for example, caves that you can draw. You just trace out what you want, uh, the shape that you want, and then within that, you can put in different assets. You can put in torches, jewels, rocks, staircases, whatever you might want. Um, and then you can also insert things like torches and lanterns. And then using those, you can change, you can assign them to be light sources uh, within the maps. You can change how the lighting works. Uh, you can change where the lighting's coming from. You can change how the yeah. shadows work. You can do different things with windows and doors and whether they're open or not. Um, it just, there's, we really can't do it justice just describing to you. Um, trying to describe to you all the things that it can do because it really can do so much in terms of your creativity and allowing you to do what you want to with your dungeons. And let's let's show let's show a bigger one. This is this is a great underground complex. Yeah, this here. is more of a dungeony example of the things that it can do. But we have this other bad Larry here. And this is an actual keep that we designed. And as you can see, they're, they're just a load of different things to make it that, to make what you're describing that much more interactive for your characters. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that I'm going to do something like this for everything that I have in my campaign, but every now and then it's a fun thing to do. And this is easily adaptable to the use of miniatures. But you can see the different assets that Alexander was talking about. I mean, if you go back here to the kitchen area, you can go, you can get the detail down to the point of putting carrots on the table. Mm -hmm. There are... Uh, places where you can have tables, you can have, again, as he was mentioning, there are torches, but you can do candles, you can do treasure chests. But the great thing about it to me as well is you can also do, if you look out here on the outer edge, you can see the moat that we've put in, you can see all the vegetation that is growing up in uh, up to the moat itself. Mm -hmm. 
Then you can also have doorways and things that go through the castle walls. Just no end of stuff that you can do with Dungeon Draft, the, the program Dungeon Draft. Uh, you can get this through. I can't exactly remember. These guys. It. Yeah. These guys, this place this here. This website right here. Go there. Uh, it's easy to understand once you get there. I can't remember the name of it for the life. Yeah, once, neither can I. Once you, a, we purchased it quite a while ago. Yeah, once you get there, it's easy to understand and work through to get it to purchase. But then also, uh, we don't actually have any of these, but I know that you can download resource packs for it as well. So if you want to change um, some of the settings of the things that you're creating uh, into a different RPG or whatever else, uh, they do have different things you can purchase and download to change the assets that you can use so different beds different different styles crates whatever yeah so there's the the options are pretty limitless with things that you can create with this and yeah but again we're not trying to get away from the way that you develop a dungeon hmm. all we're saying is that this is another way once you've taken into account all of those elements that we think should be in the development yeah. should, should be involved in the development of a dungeon in a campaign this is just another way to express that dungeon that you've decided that you want to create. Yeah. And it can be every bit as much fun to create a dungeon in Dungeon Draft as it can be to create it on graph paper. But I gotta tell you, there are times when graph paper trumps everything else. I mean, yeah. it's, it's just the way that I'm gonna end up going. But now and again, it's kind of fun to do this. It's neat. Good stuff. That's all I've got in the development of dungeons. If you guys have software that you use, or if you are strictly old school and all you want to do is use graph paper, which I'm with you, um, you know, let us know. Let us know the kinds of things that you develop, or maybe the steps that you follow to develop your own dungeons, or your own keeps, or your yeah. own countries, or your own cities. Everybody's going to have probably a slightly different way that they end up doing this. And if you tell us what you're doing, that might be something that we want to integrate into the way that we approach D&D. So that's all I've got on Dungeons today. I'm Jim. I'm Alex. Keep your short on free. Bye-bye.